Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to talk about the conservation of energy. And we've looked at in previous lectures, kinetic energy and potential energy. And now we want to look at what it means for energy to be conserved, that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but can be transfer transformed from one form to another. So let's go ahead and get started here. And what we find is let's look at examples. Last time we looked at conservative forces and those were forces that where the did not depend the path was not dependent on the results. So the change in energy did not depend on the path that you took. And we looked at that with one of the cars where it could take a simple track or it could take a looping track. But if it ended up at the same spot, if there were no if there were all forces were conservative, then it would be the same result. Now, an example of the of a non conservative force would be the force of friction. And that is because the work done against friction depends upon the path that is taken. So if it is a longer path, it's going to undergo more frictional force than if you take a shorter path. What happens when you look at friction is that the energy still is not destroyed, but it is removed from the system. So it is gone, it is converted to thermal energy, in other words, heat. So that may heat things up, but energy is then removed from the system. So an object will not reach quite as high of a path on a track, for example, if friction is involved, because some of the energy, some of that potential energy was converted into kinetic energy, and some of the potential energy would be converted into thermal energy or heat and that heat energy is removed and the more friction there is the more energy will be removed. So work done by a non conservative force can add or remove mechanical energy from a system. And we look at the example here. Uh, when we look at these two systems. So we could look an example of this in our image on the left we have an example of conservative forces. So when the object is dropped here on a spring it compresses the spring but the spring is an example of a conservative force so the spring will then push it back upward and when it eventually reaches its maximum value and stops moving up here it will have the exact same potential energy that it had when it started and that would be as long as we have no uh, non-conservative forces. So we have to be ignoring air resistance and any losses within the spring because technically the spring would heat up a little bit that would lose a little bit of force in this and air resistance would heat up the air with anything moving through the air and that would cause that but if we can ignore those things if they're very small then the object will reach back up to the same level. Now in a non conservative system on the right hand side the object falls and smacks into the table. So here it had potential energy. If we define this as the zero point of potential energy, then it has no potential energy anymore. It's not moving, so it no longer has kinetic energy. And that means where did the energy go? Well, it went into heat, sound, and perhaps deforming the ground. So the ground, depending on how hard that is, could be deformed in this strike. And that is where the energy went. So energy is still conserved. It is just removed from the system, which was that rock falling. So it's then taken out of there, becomes heat, and dissipates outward. So let's continue with this. And what we find is looking now at the work energy theorem and how are we going to have to adjust this. So the network is the change in the mechanical energy of the system. And what we're adding in this time is that we have the non conservative work. And we need to add that in as well when we're doing calculations. So if there is a frictional force or air resistance that comes in here and we need to be able to consider that. So if you remember the work energy theorem was just the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy was equal to the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy. So we had those two. Now we've added in this new term. 
So what we're looking at, let's look at an, at an example here as we look as we're pushing this box up a ramp, it is gaining mechanical energy. So it is getting higher up. So the force the person is exerting has to be greater than the frictional force. So there must be a net force moving it up the ramp. Otherwise, if the two forces, if the frictional force were greater, then the box would not move, it would be stuck there. So we know that the work done by the person is greater than the work done by friction. Now let's look at an example here. And what we want to calculate here is the distance that a 65 kilogram baseball player slides, given that the initial speed was six, uh, six meters per second. And there is a force of friction is a constant 450 newtons. So we know a few things here. So let's go ahead and uh, move our sketch and write down what we know. So we know these uh, three things here that the mass we know the initial velocity and we know the final uh, we know the frictional force so we can look at our work energy theorem and pull that up here and our work energy theorem says that the kinetic energy initial plus the potential energy is e plus the non-conservative work is equal to the sum of the final kinetic and potential energies so what do we know here well we know that the initial kinetic energy plus the non-conservative work have to equal zero because at the end of this there's no potential energy involved because we don't have any change in potential so these are gone and the final kinetic energy either he is going to stop at the base so the final kinetic energy is zero so all that's left is the kinetic energy and the non-conservative work and they have to add up to zero so let's summarize those we know that the kinetic energy is one half mv squared and we know the mass and the initial velocity and then we have the frictional force times the distance. Remember that work is force times distance. So the force is 450 newtons and we're trying to find the distance. So what we're going to want to do is to rearrange this equation to solve for distance. And if we do that, we would find that distance equals m times v sub i squared divided by 2f. And then we can put in the numbers that we know from up above and calculate and find that the distance that he will slide is 2.6 meters. So this is an example of working this with a non-conservative force so that we can then uh, see kind of get a little bit of an idea of how that works. So we're adding in the frictional force. Now, of course, it could be made more complicated if there was a change in potential energy or if the person did not stop. If they were still moving, we might have to look at the final kinetic energy. So it can be more complicated than this, but it gets you a bit of a start on it. All right, let's go ahead and look at a couple other things here when we talk about the law of conservation of energy, which means that the total energy in any process is constant. What changes is the form of the energy. So we can have different types of energy and energy can be transferred from one system to another. So we can change from chemical energy to uh, kinetic energy for example or we can can change from kinetic energy into potential energy so we can change the type of energy but the total amount of en any of energy does not change so we look at some of those examples again kinetic and potential energy we can also have things like electrical energy chemical energy in terms of storage radiant energy nuclear energy and thermal energy or heat so we can have a number of different ways to be able to convert the energy and it can always be convert be converted from one of these forms so there's always going to be the same total amount of energy so what is what are our problem solving strategies when we want to look at this so first of all we want to determine the system and what are we looking for what is the quantity we're looking for and again, make a sketch. If you're not given a sketch with a problem, making one is a great way to kind of summarize things. Label on the sketch different values that you know. It makes it a lot easier to find what you're trying to get.
then we need to think about all of the forces involved. And what version of the work energy theorem uh, do we need? So we look at for conservative forces, if it's just conservative forces, we use our original version, just the kinetic energies and the potential energies. Now for the if there are non conservative forces involved, then we have to add in our non conservative work here. But we also have any other energies. So for for our purposes right now in this class, I won't be worrying about other types of energy. I want you to know that they're there. But in terms of working any problems, we would be looking at either for the conservative forces or the non conservative forces, adding in the non conservative work term. Now we want to eliminate terms when possible. And remember, an easy way to do that if potential energy is involved, choose the initial or final height to be your zero point. So you can define what you want to be zero. If something goes to the ground, then we want to consider we want to consider maybe the ground as being zero. And also remember some of the terminology. Sometimes you are given information indirectly. For example, if you're told in a problem that something starts from rest or ends at rest, then you're being told the initial or final velocity. You may not be told that the initial velocity is zero. That's what me what it means when it starts from rest. So it is initial velocity is zero, meaning you can zero out the initial kinetic energy. So the more of the terms that you can get rid of, the easier it will make your calculations. And of course, you always want to check at the end to make sure your answer is reasonable. For example, if you're calculating a velocity, does it make sense if you do a velocity calculation for a car and find out that it's moving at twice the speed of light, then we know something is quite wrong there because the velocity will have to make sense. So it has to be a reasonable velocity for that object. All right, how about transformation of energy? We see this all the time. So for example, we have energy stored in food. That's a chemical energy. And we can convert that into thermal energy. What does photosynthesis do? Well, it converts light energy into chemical energy, which can be go back to being food. A boiler can convert chemical energy boiling something so you're heating it up using some sort of fuel whether it be wood or coal or gas to boil something that heats it up making it thermal energy which may turn say a turbine that generates electrical energy so you can actually go through various different stages and you can think about a solar cell which takes light energy and converts it directly to electrical energy. So there are many different ways we can transform energy from one form to another. And the last thing I want to talk about in this section is efficiency. How efficient is something? Well, nothing can ever be 100% efficient. And we'll look at that when we talk about thermodynamics. But the output of useful energy must always be less than the energy input. So the amount of energy you put into some kind of machine, there's always going to be some kind of loss. And that can be frictional losses or other things. But the efficiency of an, of an, of an engine is defined by the useful energy or work output divided by the total energy input. So sometimes it can be rather efficient. If you look at the numbers for a gas heater, it is 98% efficient, but nothing can be 100. There's always going to be a little bit of energy loss. A steam engine, on the other hand, is only about 17% efficient, so much lower. A gasoline engine is more efficient than that. And swimming, very inefficient, that a lot of energy is being lost. So very little of the energy of the swimmer is actually going in to moving, moving them. Much, much of it is going to water resistance as they try to move through the water. So I don't look at a specific example of it here, but you may need to calculate the efficiency of something as well using this. So let's go ahead and finish up with our summary and what we find we talked about non conservative forces and those are the ones that can add or remove mechanical energy from a system.
A common one that we'll look at is friction. That's one we hear about all the time. And friction is a very common example of a non conservative force. And remember, it what it, the non conservative force means that the path makes a difference. So if you're taking a much longer path to get from one point to another, the friction is going to be higher and you're going to lose more energy. And then finally, we looked at the efficiency and it varies. It can be very good or very bad, but it is always less than 100%. There is no way to have anything perfectly efficient. You're always going to have some at least some small amount of energy loss. So that completes this lecture on conservation of energy. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day, everyone. And I will see you in class.